Hey, what's up? Welcome to another episode of What's Up Conversations, a podcast with inspiring artists and storytellers. I'm your host, Hamid Reza Nikufar, and in this episode, I have a composer and a unique producer as my guest. He's the score producer of Joker, Chernobyl, the co-composer of Battlefield 2042, and his latest album is available on all the major music streaming services under the name of I Do Not Wish To Be Known As A Vandal. Ladies and gentlemen, my awesome guest today is Sam Slater. In this episode, Sam and I talk about sound design, music production, his latest album, using nature as inspiration to tell his stories, working with this amazing wife, Hildur Gunnadotter, and of course, Battlefield 2042, how it started, and how it's going forward. Before we begin, please consider subscribing to What's Up Conversations if you're enjoying the content of this podcast. What's Up Conversations is on YouTube and all the major podcast streaming services. To learn more about What's Up Conversations, please visit nicofarmusic.com and keep up with my next guests on my Twitter handle at hrnicofar. Thank you for tuning in. Let's go. Hello and welcome to What's Up Conversation, Sam. It's so lovely to have you on the podcast. I've been a fan of your uh, work and I always wanted to get to know you and your workflow more. So I'm happy to have you here, considering the fact that I know how busy you are these days. So thank you so much for being here. Of course. Thank you for asking. Me. Yeah. All <laughs> right. So, man, the new al- new album, the the uh, it's called "I Do Not Wish to Be Known as a Vandal." is It's just amazing. I love the storytelling of it. I love the sound design in it, and the cohesive journey between each track. It's a great piece of art. Tell me about this new album, the idea behind it, and the meaning of the title, of course, which so many people might have this as a question. <laughs> yeah. Um. The new record is. Uh, the new record is, it basically started uh, as I had this sort of mental image of just this like body collapsing. And um, I think it honestly started out as some form of sort of probably a kind of Brexit metaphor, but sort of general political collapse feeling and, and being sort of unsure as to whether I was, you know. Uh, Maybe COVID whether, had something to do it with too. I think maybe, yeah, Yeah. just this like feeling that you're like, you're like, I'm not sure whether I'm in the process of something collapsing or something being rebuilt, but um, it's happening so slowly. I'm not quite sure what part of the, of the gesture I'm in. And I really wanted to make a record um, where one side of the vinyl was, was the collapse and one side was the getting back up again. It was just this single, very slow gesture from, you know, from one side to the other and, and, uh, being raised on sort of 70s prog records. I, I always really liked records where you could sort of choose your own journey through it. So I thought it would be nice to kind of make something where you could, you know, you could start with side B and end up on side A and it would tell you a different story. Um, so that's sort of where that came from. And um, the title actually, the title, I do not wish to be known as a bandle, um, sort of it's, it's got two sides, uh, one of which is um, that I, I firmly believe that in the world in 2022, uh, I at least personally don't really want to contribute much in the way of like destructive energy. Um, that doesn't mean at all that I want to like maintain the status quo at all. I mean, the status quo is pretty rough these days, honestly, but um, but the, um, the constructive and compassionate kind of energy can be uh, uh, incredibly powerful and the, I'm sort of staking my claim on that. Um, and also, obviously, the, 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 the subtle joke being that I, I live and work in Germany and the, the Vandals were a sort of, were a Germanic tribe from, from the, uh, I believe like 1300s. It's quite a long time ago. And uh, this is me sort of like questioning whether I, uh, I truly identify with being German or not um because i've been here a long time now um and it is home and, uh, so it's um it's a subtle nod to my my um having left the uk and n- not really wanting to go back uh, yeah so, so uh, uh, it, do you consider this album as a uh, body horror <laughs> As a body horror, <laughs> yeah, body horror is what, what a subgenre. Do you mean by body, horror? body horror is a subgenre in horror movies where it's all uh, the horror comes from the uh, collapsing of the body, I and mean, for David Cronenberg or such. So I was like, because wow. I, I heard you talk about this in other interviews, I was like, 
maybe it's a subject of body horror in music. <laughs> That's a fascinating idea. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't know. Uh, potentially, um, uh, potentially uh, uh, unintentionally. Um, yeah. But I'll have to do some research on body horror and find out whether that is. Uh, yeah. Whether that is sort of what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it, it, could, you, could you give me some good examples of what to, of what to look at? Yeah, sure. David Cronenberg is uh, one of the masters of the uh, genre. Uh, David Cronenberg, well, some Italian uh, movies. Uh, nothing suspicious come to my mind right now. But The Fly, for example. David Cronenberg, yeah, The Fly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen. yeah. All right. Um, so, but, yeah, by the way, for those who haven't listened to the album yet, it's available on all the major music streaming apps under the title I Do Not Wish to Be Known as a Vandal. So let's go and listen to it. All right. So, uh, Sam, let's go back and talk about your background. Tell me how you got into music and uh, t- uh, tell me about your success story. Oh, um, got into music by uh, air drumming in the back of my parents' car. Um, I, I believe... Uh, embarrassing as it is that probably all roads, uh, I think probably the earliest musical memory I have is air drumming to Phil Collins in the back of my parents' car. I like to claim it was Genesis, but I reckon it probably was Phil Collins. Where were you born, by uh, the way? I'm born in Southwest uh, UK, wow. a place called the Cotswolds. It's very pretty and uh, um, not not very exciting, though, you know, um, <laughs> Why not? It's a beautiful. It's exciting place. now because it's your birthplace. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, that's the thing is like as I've spent longer away from it, I recognize what's quite so lovely about it. But um, uh, when you grow up there, as as I'm sure everyone experiences, you're like, I gotta leave this place and go to the city. Yeah. So, um, but I just, I, you know, I just studied and played, uh, played a lot of drums, played in a lot of bands, went to, I uh, studied composition a lot while I was a. Uh, I was sort of really fascinated by music theory, which is strange considering I think it was probably compensating for being a drummer and everything being rhythmic and I wanted to know how notes worked. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, just studied and explored and explored. And I think realistically the, the, the most significant decision was, a, was the decision to move to Berlin about 10 years ago, um, which was fairly off the cuff. It was just a decision made and um you know i found so much so much exciting experimental music when i got there and um they have less of a dependency on 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 words so there's less songwriting there um so um or at least the scenes i ended up hanging out in had less songwriting in it and um so just ended up focusing much more on on you know experiments and sound design and all of this kind of stuff and yeah, and then ten years passed, and here I am. So. Wow! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great journey. So, uh, yeah. why, why Jer- do you, do you ever uh, think about moving? I don't know to LA, no. considering your work. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, because because they say like, yeah, you gotta if you want to get work, yeah, you know, like making music for movies, or games. Uh, I don't know, you gotta move to LA. But do, do you believe that? No, I, I actually don't. And I think it's, um, so the, the thing that I genuinely believe is that like, if you, if you want to be part of the movie industry as such, like, yeah, you do need some proximity to it. I, I do understand that, you know, the industry is really in LA you know and london and but you know the the movies that we the at least the the movies the games the the work that i'm excited by is not there it's really huh. it's really not there and i think that the the potential to cause yourself sort of musical damage by just sort of going and hanging out in the place where the sort of like the, 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 the industry ladder is, is quite strong. So, you know, I, I got a lot of, I got a lot of friends that have moved to LA. I don't see their music getting that much better. 
I, I notice that their ability to score things gets better, but I don't see their music getting better. At which point the question I, I would ask is like, what's your, what's your drive? It's like, are you trying to make, are you trying to make good music or are you trying to, you know, are you trying to score films? Cause they are kind of two different things. Um, and I don't know, like at least personally, the, I think the world is, uh, <laughs> you know, the world's, uh, um, it's hard to justify making music uh, always, <laughs> you know, like you're like, there's some, no. it, you know what I mean? The world is a pretty messy place. Uh, we sh- making music can be quite a sort of self-focused act. And I think if you're going to do it, I think if you're going to do it, you, you, you should really make sure that you get to the end of your life and you're like, well, I, I really did it. You know, like I really, I really tried to make some great music. And to me, moving, therefore moving to LA to me feels like a bit of a distraction from that. Like that's, that's my feeling. And, and it's been, it's been confirmed by a lot of like incredible European composers that I see that, that don't live anywhere near there that find lots of beautiful and interesting work. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because music, uh, by the end of the day, is an expression of self. And if you don't see yourself there, so of course your music is not there. So that's a great point. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's talk about uh, Battlefield. So Battlefield yeah. franchise is one of my favorite games ever. And this franchise has such well-known and beloved themes. And, uh, 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 and each game explores a new kind of music. I actually uh, had... You and Soderquist and Patrick Andre and the composers of the last two games on the podcast. So Battlefield oh. 2042 is just like all the other Battlefield games that its own sound. And I was so amazed by the approach you and Hilder have had on this game. Considering the story of Battlefield that happens in the environmental apocalypse, you guys created this industrial or organic and yet manipulated sound field for the music of Battlefield 2042, which is mean and in line with the world of the game. So this was very daring and groundbreaking approach to score this game. I'm curious, how did you guys get this gig? Were were you familiar with the franchise? And tell me about the process of making the soundtrack for Battlefield 2042. Sure. So, I mean, it, it came about um, through some conversations, just conversations with the EA and, um, you know, both Hilda and I have uh, obviously been very interested in how to make sure that like climate awareness is a part of the work that we do. And, and um, uh, so when this project came around, that was the attractive part of it. I don't think either Hilda or I are, uh, I don't, we're very pacifist. I'm not sure like scoring war games is so exciting for us as the <laughs> dominant idea. Um, but the, the climate angle and these kind of realistic, but not, you know, these, these worlds that are not science fiction, um, they're tangible, even though they're just in the future. Um, and with climate as this huge character within the levels, um, that was really exciting. Um, and the approach we took the approach we took to scoring it was really, um, it was relatively simple, um, though it was ultimately, uh, it was really restricted by, not restricted, it was definitely influenced by the fact that COVID happened and our original plans, our original plans had to become much, much more focused on our immediate sort of like staying in Berlin. It was, you know, for a large part of the, of the scoring process, we couldn't leave the city. They're like, they wouldn't let us go outside the city. So, um, which, yeah, changes what you can record and where. Um, so what we ended up doing was really digging into the real, the physical materials of the levels themselves. You know, maybe a level is, uh, maybe a level is focused on, um, for example, the dialogue between metal and sort of uh, like toxic kind of mud almost, or maybe another level is focused on sort of ice and oil, and, um, glass and sort of like we sort of in this level, I, I, it was sort of glass and the absence of humans because it's this huge cityscape and there's these towering glass structures, but no people around. 
Um, and we would take these, these elements, these kind of core material ideas, and then create sort of chaotic sound systems out of them. These kind of, we would make strange sound making machines that were kind of out of control and then just sort of like let them run and see what appeared. Um, and, um, and then try and take the chaos and pull it into things that became musical. Um, which was a it was a very fascinating process actually it was really yeah. interesting um it wasn't a very direct method so i was really grateful that the ea gave us the time to really explore and i think the result is is pretty weird for a game as as sort of loved and large as battlefield i think it's probably been fairly divisive amongst fans of the franchise um but again like my absolute respect to EA and DICE for, for kind of saying like, nope, we want to do something weird and wild and, and um, you know, and, and being with us the whole way to come to that process. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were always daring about this aspect. I mean, for for example, even for the last two battlefields where uh, kind of like they were about uh, World War One and World War Two. But but by the end of the day, you're pr playing this uh, multiplayer game, and when you're waiting in a map with like a hundred players waiting to just shoot at each other, there's this very sad music in the background that kind of sell you the world of the game, and it's like I was like, man, that's so different because usually people are like, let's pump it up, let's hype the players up, but th the setting is there, and exactly for this game, I was like, this is the closest. That of course, DICE is known very well for their groundbreaking uh, sound design in their games. And this is the closest that the music and the sound in a DICE game happened. That, And I was like, wow, this is so groundbreaking. I know they are, they, they are going against the norm. And this is so great because I kind of understand the world that I'm playing. And I kind of, the music is kind of giving me a reason like, oh, listen, the world is ending. It's like the whole environment is collapsing. And the reason you're fighting is something like very kind of like meaningless in this uh, battle. So, so it, it was very, it has a story in it. So it, it, that's so. beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that comes across. And, and I think, um, you know, The, the the question that Hilda and I have always had is like why why should um, you know first of all who to focus on in the scoring process are you focusing on the player or are you focusing on the environment it's like we ultimately decided that the environments are the things that should feel really rich and rich and chaotic and bleak when they need to and hopeful when they also need to and as a player you're almost lost in that world rather than scoring the player and therefore just being like, okay, we need some like massively heroic. Because it's like, who wants to be a hero in a world that's ending? I, I don't know. And the game people. doesn't have a hero because it doesn't have a single player. It's a multiplayer. So it's not focused on any hero. It's focused exactly. on the world of itself. Exactly, exactly. And therefore it's like, it's truly, it's truly about these levels and these environments. And, and um, you know, and... Yeah, and therefore not making a hero out of the out of the person, you know. Again, there isn't a, a single player, but there is there is my experience as yeah. a as a as a as a gamer sort of sat with the screen and not making a hero out of that out of that interaction. Um, yeah. I think it's kind of again, like I thought it was a really interesting approach, and, and the team the team at Dice are. Um, They're pretty outrageous. The sound, they're, yeah. they're crazy. Are you so, are you still, by the way, making music for the game? Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For yeah. The we, updates we're, of we're finishing off. Uh, yeah, I just got the one. new. Yeah, I got the exactly. I got the season one. Uh, season one, and was like, oh, there are new music in it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So season one, we we actually finished season one a little while ago, and then season season two, when it comes, is we just we just finished the music for that, and then. Did you know at the beginning of the project that this is going to be this long collaboration? And did you plan any anything like, all right, in 
a- any uh, kind of love, uh, a kind of like update or a DLC, we're gonna approach it differently in music. Did you plan it, or are you going as long as the game is goes going? Well, it's a balance of the two, right? So you're like you you learn from you learn from what you know. You, profound statement you learn from what you learn so like you know you look at uh, um you know there are things that we've looked at from the original material and said like this was more or less successful um in in conveying the kind of uh, ideas that we're excited by so that's been great we have we've, we've modified our approach slightly but at the same time we we looked at the the new content as an opportunity to actually expand the ideas further so it's it's um there's not there's not not moving in any you know we have no desire to like um you know take a different approach for example it's it's like um it's an opportunity if anything to just kind of focus it and and make it even more um yeah extend the world further hopefully yeah You're doing great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, considering your uh, successful collaboration with uh, Hildur uh, Gunnarsdottir, uh, what uh, what advice and and tips do you have for those who want to collaborate with other composers and musicians? Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, I mean, first of all, like Hildur and I, uh, she's my she's my wife. We yep. we liked our collaboration enough that we decided to just collaborate on everything. So, um, which is, which is, it's a perfect the, marriage. <laughs> we, 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 really, I mean, we, we have a great time and that's so nice. Um, and I think in that it's like, um, you know, collaborating is funny. It, it, it's, um, when I was a bit younger, I used to look at, like, I would look at musicians that I love and then I would look at the collaborations they've done and I would be like, okay, so it's this kind of person that I should be collaborating with and that, and I would use it, I would sort of profile people and, and think like, you know, in a quite a cynical way that that's what collaboration was. But as I've got older, I realized that these people are ultimately just, it's, it's about the, the joy of creating work with, with friends, really. Um, and, you know, if you see people, myself included, that only collaborate once, then your question is often why? Like, what, why, why did this collaboration only happen <laughs> one time? And, you know, collaborating is, is this fascinating space to be in. You're like really, you're really required to, to, to understand what your own ideas you believe in, what you're prepared to, you know, to, to say, hey, I believe in this, but also at the same time, like, I'm open and able to to, to be uh, flexible and and you know it's a it's a very vulnerable thing I think actually to collaborate with people and um, to me it's where the real you know it's the place where like the you you really you really learn how you as a musician are. I think it's a really special space, really. Um, I'm doing, a, I'm doing right, right now um, is I'm in a place called Castle in Germany. I'm doing a theater piece um, with, again, an Icelandic director. And um, we are, there's 200 individual artists on stage. Wow. It's like, it's so many people. And you know, yesterday and the day before, we've been going through the process of finally, when everything comes together, having, you know, he is a director, it's going like, oh shit, like it's way too long, and this is too slow. And, uh, and now the, the collaborative process is really, you know, you have to, you have to uh, be happy to, yeah, I don't know, sort of kill, kill your violence or whatever you want to call it, you know, like, yesterday like half the work that, that i've been doing for this thing just got cut ah. and you're like well that's okay like it's you know that's that's fine it's like it's for the you know we, we're making a piece and the piece is better for it everything is more succinct you know and that's wonderful but you also one side of your brain is like hey i did all of this work and then the other side is like no collaboration involves like really taking a step back So do you kind of like divide 
uh, the work stuff. I mean, you sit down like, okay, I take care of this, you take care of this, or are you going uh, in parallel together and doing everything together? We, we pretty much just sit in, a, at least with, with Hilda and I, we just sit in a room together. Um, yeah. You know, so Hilda specifically, she has, she can write melodies more intuitively than anyone I've ever met in my life. She's phenomenal at it. Um, and she has a great understanding of, of just, just how like melodies and lines should develop. She doesn't really think about harmony, which is interesting. She doesn't really, if you're like, what chords is that? She's like, no, 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 yeah. But she's just writing lines that work against each other. So it's like, it's a series of melodies that move against each other, sort of classic kind of counterpoint writing. But, in her own in her own way and um and so if what we're doing needs more of that then she takes the lead and i sit quietly behind her and watch what she's doing and make sure that she has tea and um you know get out of the room when she needs some space to concentrate it's another another one um and then if what we're doing needs more production more sound design more um, bringing together in the actual quality of the sounds. Um, then she, she sits behind me and goes, that's nice. Or, ooh, don't like that. And, you know, so there's always someone in front and someone behind. Um, but most of the time we're together, we don't really, I don't like ask her to sort of, all right, you do this cue and I'll do that cue. It doesn't tend to work in that way. Yeah. Um, and that's nice. Yeah. It was very slow. It's very slow. It's really <laughs> nice way of working. Yeah. But the quality um, is the proof of this, uh, that the collaboration is working. So speaking of uh, uh, Icelandic uh, artists, man, what's up with these guys? <laughs> they're so good in music and everything they do. Do you think it's because of the environment they were raised? It's, it's it, 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 the beauty of it, the vastness of it, the nature they were. Uh, Have you been to Iceland? No, but I just, I'm in person. You gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> it's, um, Iceland, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, and my feeling to this, you know, this question is, is, um, is sort of two things. It's like, they have a culture of being, you know, it's a small type music scene which is, and it's, there's just one. It's not like there's that one and then there's more in different places in Iceland. It's just the Reykjavik music scene. And they have a sort of understanding that they're going to be just world-class. So no one even considers being really average. They just do it. And that's beautiful. Um, and I just, I wonder if, I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's totally beautiful. But I don't know if it's that that's causing them to be so excellent. I think it might just be that they're, they're again, they're really collaborative. They're really supportive. They don't compete in the same way as people in Berlin might do. You know, they don't, there's none of that. They're just like really supportive. They're really, really curious and, um, it's a very healthy, it's a very healthy music scene. Yeah, there, there um, is this documentary for uh, Sigurus and I was watching that, the people in Iceland, and, I'm, and I was like, man, this is something very different. And I kind of get it where the music coming from. So exactly yeah. as you're mentioning, they're not collab uh, uh, not like against each other or kind of like a collaborative. It's, it's so fucking <laughs> unique yeah, to their culture. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, but I think the, um, you know, the, the, the thing to remember is, is it's like, it's like, it's 300,000 people in total. It's really wow. small, <laughs> but at the same time, it, it has, it operates like, you know, like a mini New York or something like that. You know, they're just like, can you, can you imagine how, how healthy New York would be if it only had 300,000 people in it and everyone <laughs> kind of collaborated it's they're not fighting for sort of <laughs> limited artistic resources in the same way so instead of skyscrapers they have mountains beautiful mountains <laughs> beautiful, a lot of volcanoes lots and lots yeah. of volcanoes so yeah, yeah it's a lot of um, yeah it should definitely go over 
Right. So, uh, next question. I'm so curious about this because this is where you shine, man, so much. I love this thing about you. I love the way you sound design, man. How's your approach to sound design and music? Uh, do you come up with sounds and then start the music, or does it come along as you're making the music? Often, I think, at least my sound design is. Oh, that's a really hard question. I don't really see sound design and music as particularly separate. So uh, I very often, uh, let's take, for example, um, m- like my new record genuinely just started as two sounds that I really liked. It's two sound processes that I just uh, really moved me. They're strange uh, processes um, that I, I tend to just like make a lot of sounds or I'm exploring different kinds of processes to see whether something might yield good results. And I, I save the things I love and I delete the things I don't love. And that, by the way, one rule that like, uh, I, I can't remember who told this to me, but they were just like, oh yeah, you just delete everything you don't love. And then your hard drive just fills full of things that you love. Wow. Like, that's great. <laughs> that's a good idea. Like don't, don't, you know, like don't keep the shit you don't like. And the same with like, when you're doing versions, it's just like stop when you like it. And that means that when you come back to it, you, you're never second guessing. Cause you're just like, I know I like this cause I wouldn't have saved it if I didn't. Yeah. Anyway. So um, I, I thought this was a, as a working idea, as someone who also can second guess themselves quite a lot, like I thought that was very useful. But anyway, so these two processes, um, uh, one is based on sort of uh, some granular synthesis of a, of a, like a kind of, it's like a viola, but it has additional strings on it. Um, and uh, the other one was to do with um, using, uh, I, think it, I think it was probably Melodyne to like, to like grab, voices out of uh out of polyphonic recordings so you just grab a you grab a single voice and you then use other processes to accentuate the artifacts because obviously it's quite bad at doing it um and uh you accentuate the artifacts and the artifacts become sort of more part of the sound than the voice itself and um and then like those are the foundations that's that's the you know the the, the com- composition comes from the comes from the sound that you fall in love with in the first place, um, and then it's just about applying sort of compositional processes to that. So maybe asking instrumentalists to come and you know uh, rework or or imitate or develop. The, I like these artifacts. How can we represent that musically? Or, um, you know, in, in things like, for example, in Battlefield um, or in maybe Chernobyl is even, a, even a, uh, a better idea. Like Chernobyl is ultimately like we built, the idea is really the sound design. Go to a nuclear reactor, make as many recordings as you can of things you're interested in, bring that back do a lot of processing. And I mean, this processing was mostly done uh, with tape machines and, and some pretty savage digital EQing. Um, and just, you know, build a library of things that you're, again, in love with and then build music out of it. And don't get me wrong, then halfway through the process, you're like, shit, I really need to build a, an organ or something like that. I need to build something that feels kind of more musical and that sound design. Um, at which point you obviously then dig back in and find what you can. But, um, yeah, this is great it, that uh, you, you guys always look for the world that you're living in as the instrument. And, yeah. and this, I don't know if the guys at Dice kind of like uh, they had this in mind, like, oh, these guys know how to make music based on uh, the uh, any organic thing in the work or anything like piece of metal or something and this goes exactly in a parallel with what we're making so yeah i i think you're you're you kind of like see always opportunity in anything that it can create sound it can make, create an instrument ultimately sure 
Yeah. I, I mean, that, that is true. And uh, like, you can, um, I mean, like bluntly, like if you can get a sine wave out of it or a noise or like, or like, or noise, you can, you know, you can create literally anything. Um, it depends on how much it's very time intensive to do so. But I just, I've always loved the idea that like, you know, rather than us just like falling in love with synthesizers again, um, which I'm in Berlin, everybody loves synthesizers. I have a synthesizer, <laughs> right? Here. I also love synthesizers, but like conceptually speaking, since we can find those waves almost wherever, like why not, why not source them from places that have relevance and places that have meaning? Um, yeah, find your sine waves and find your noise waves uh, elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. The other day, uh, uh, it was last week. I was looking for a, a particular guitar a guitar sound, and yeah. I like I can hear this in my head, but I don't know if it is possible to do it with a guitar. And I was as I was thinking about it, my air conditioner was in full full throttle, and I'm like. Oh, what if I like add distortion to this sound and add some tremolo to it, and it goes exactly? And I executed exactly what I was had in mind. It's crazy. The, the sound was right there. Air conditioner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then like totally, and then and and it's your air conditioner, and it's not someone else's. Yeah. And you you will always have a personal relationship to that sound in a way that potentially a guitar from a library or something like that would would never give you the same satisfaction. That's a good point. Do you think is it dangerous that you're so personally attached to a sound that it might kind of become so dear to you that you wouldn't see the problem in it in the music yeah totally, totally. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, but that's a problem yeah no i mean 100 it happens all the time where you're just like i love the sound look at the crazy process i did to make exactly it. and you're like but it doesn't help at all yeah. um and the thing that i would say in that i i think we just have all got to be self-reflective and enough and not precious about stuff and you know as i make more music as i work with more people on more things i think i get better at understanding that you know the 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 the, the value of a specific sound or the value of a specific um piece if it doesn't help what we're trying to do together then you know I, you just got to say okay and you gotta just chuck it. Yeah. You know, so bad, but... yeah. Let, let, let's go geeky here, man. So, what are some of your favorite plugins and tools making sound and making music? Um. So I know it's a very broad question, but no, that's okay. But, um, yeah. So uh, geeky, geeky, geeky. Man, you'd recognize all the plugins on my computer. It's not. It's nothing too crazy. I use. Um, I don't really love plugins. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't know. really totally fall in love with plugins. You're a hardware like, analog guy. I have quite a lot of like analog equipment in my studio. Uh, the main thing that I, I fell in love with for the Battlefield score was this um, uh, uh, this thing called an uh, Overstay uh, uh, Modular Channel. Do you know it? Uh, no. Oh, dude, you got to yeah. check this yeah. thing out. It's, it's very cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a box covered with with knobs and uh it's got it's like a couple of preamps uh a little eq section some filters a compressor wow there's ruthless ruthless a compressor a um distortion and then at the end the thing that's crucial is it has a kind of matrix mixer that allows you to feed things in through different wow. routes if you do this <laughs> i mean and it, you can like it, it the filters will will get to the point of self resonating, but you can also then just send that to the side chain of the thing. So you can take these very small sounds and just totally new things come out of them. Wow. You know, it's it's a very and it's very hands on and very tangible. And, and I I had a lot of fun with that in, in my um, in my messing around for this. Um, and they're made by a small company in uh, in LA. And I would strongly recommend everyone who ever has, I think they're like about 2,000 euros. So it's not, it's not free at all, but it's like, 
the next time you find yeah. 2000 euro, my friend, you go again. <laughs> um, and there's that. And I mean, uh, I, I have, um, uh, I recently just have been messing around with a specific, like, um, do you know the company make noise? That oh, makes synthesizers. Yeah. I think I know make noise. Yeah. Yeah. They're beautiful. They make, uh, again, it's an instrument builder in, in the States and they make, they make lovely strain synthesizers and I've been having fun with that. Um, but really the thing that, the thing that I'm most excited by is often just like building, uh, I really like building instruments and I like building systems. So, you know, uh, yeah, like I've just made this, um, actually <laughs> we have a, have a new band that's going to be uh, coming at the end of the year for a couple of live shows, which is, um, it's, it's me, Hilda, uh, a guy called James, who used to play in a band called Empty Set, if you know them. Oh. And also a guy called Ruli from another band called Senyawa. They're like, wow. it's heavy, 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 heavy music. Yes. And it's all self-made instruments. So that's really wow. fun. It's like, uh, it's going to be me on this sort of... Does it have a name? It, it's called Osmium. It's named <laughs> after the heaviest, the heaviest yes. metal on the planet. So we thought that was fun. Um, and he's, you know, he's on vocals, uh, really on vocals. And then everyone else has self-built um, uh, instruments. Hilda has a, a, a cello that's full of speakers um, wow. and has extra strings in it. My friend James has this, he calls it the power plank. It's basically a, a six string bass that you lie on its back and, um, you tune everything in octaves and fifths. So it's really <laughs> just interesting. It's huge. Wow. And, and I've been building this, this drum that has a very large speaker mounted into the bottom skin. And then again, a synthesis system that runs through it. So wow. like, that's the stuff for me where, where uh, it's, you get some pretty strange, wild sounds out of that. So yeah, I, I, I can't fun. wait for that. I can't wait for yeah. that band. So uh, let's talk about your favorites. Now we're talking about band. What, uh, what are some of your favorite bands that inspired you in your uh, music career? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I always, like, I grew up playing drums. So, like, it was a lot of bands with, um, you know, when I was... Violin in them? Sorry? Uh, uh, I, mean, I've been learning, I have been learning. I have been learning. It's, it's, uh, it's so, yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I think maybe like um, bands like, I mean, when I was a teenager, like there was always bands like the Mars Volta and bands like Tool. I just took my 10 year old steps yeah. on to go watch Tool and blew wow. his mind. It was the first concert. So that was very really fun. Um, but also, you know, like uh, all of the sort of like classics of, of English pop music. So I mean, obviously like Pink Floyd and Yes and all of this stuff. Um, and um, I just, I just love bands with great drummers. Um, so, but then as I get older, like, uh, then I think the things that I'm more influenced by is definitely, it's got a lot quieter and a lot, you know, I, for example, I was just listening to a new record by a, a composer called uh, Callie Malone. Um, if you don't know her, she's yeah. you know wonderful composer, um, and it's very soft, very droney, um, but really, really beautiful. And I find that it, it, I don't think it needs a drummer. You know, it's really, <laughs> it's really, really good, um, and. Also, I also listen to a, like I also listen to a lot of hip hop and things like that. So I'm like really, uh, I'm pretty happy to listen to most things. To be honest. So, um, so yeah, uh, it started very loud and it's got much quieter over time. But yeah, um, we all do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, hey, you, right? I mean, yeah, you're a teen, man. You need that. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong very, with that. that is very true. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm super excited for my for my my little guy Kauri. I'm super. He's about to be a teenager, and you can yeah. hear the the musical curiosity building. So I'm excited to watch that happen from this angle rather than. Oh, that's rather than, yeah. That's that's very really sweet. So, uh, so, so, so uh, what are some of your favorite soundtrack albums of all time? 
um, I don't. I don't obsess over soundtracks, so I I can only answer it from a very. Um, let me just say, like things that I've seen recently, where I've just been like, "Wow, that's a great use of a soundtrack." Because I don't really, I don't sit at home and listen to soundtrack records, for example. Um, but I love watching a film and being like, "Wow, this is really working." Um, and let's say, I think um, the the score for Tenet. I saw Tenet recently. Yeah. I was just like. This is a great score. I also am pretty sure that the main riff is almost identical to Bleed by Meshuggah. Do you know that track? Um, um, do you know that? No. I'll uh, listen to the main riff in Tenet and then listen to Bleed by Meshuggah and they're very, very... Oh yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know exactly and, uh, what sound you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, so but I think that score works fantastically uh, for this sort of really, you know, giant future scape like that. I thought that's beautiful. But then also, uh, for example, I watched um, uh, Power of the Dog, uh, Johnny Greenwood's new yeah. score. And it's, again, it's a totally different world. But he manages to he manages to be strange without ever stealing the show. He's like really. I mean, man, he's really good. Yeah, <laughs> he's really I, really I love their new uh, band with Tom York uh, called Smile. Yeah, it's good, uh, that, right? That's great music, right there. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> It's almost like they know what they're doing. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They no, have a future. Really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, future music, those guys. No, they're, they're really good. They're really, really good. Um, and I, I think that's a beautiful score. Uh, I also, let's think, I mean, classically, I also think like Johan's score for Arrival is just a thing that I always go back to and think it's such a gorgeous combination of yeah. sounds, the voice and the wooden. Um, the Sicario. By the way, Sicario is also beautiful. Yeah, that um, monstrous was a cello sound in the uh, Sicario when they're uh, moving to Mexico. At yeah. uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Is that Hilder? It is Hilder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That um, score, man. That's just monster. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really good. I mean, he was just on fire at that point. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's it, have you seen uh, his uh, sh uh, film, documentary film? Which one? The la the, I think it was the last movie uh, he made. Oh, you he mean, uh, last with, first yeah, yes, yes. With uh, Taylor yeah, Swinton yeah. uh, narrating it. Yeah. It's such I, I a. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. I um, love that experience, man. That, it's totally an experience. Like, it's just. Yeah. And then a headphone, and you're moving to some other dimensions yeah i mean he it was uh you know it was a little bit sad obviously like it sure. was the in the last years of his life he was working a lot on that in the background and and um, you know uh there's there's sort of a lot of um for those who are in the studio with him, you know, that, that project comes with a lot of additional wow. Wow. Um, sadness, yeah. honestly, like, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very easy time before he passed away. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's always worth remembering as well, the immense amount of work that this um, composer called Yair Glockman, who also worked on the score, he really, he really did an incredible amount of work to bring that project to life. And I, I would suggest you also listen to his music because you'll, you'll, you'll love it. Um, he's actually, he's the double bass player on, on my new record. So, wow. um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I think it's a beautiful project and the, 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 the footage and everything. That was wonderful. Um, and yeah. 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 I'm glad, glad people are watching it. Yeah. Great. So, all right, yeah. this is it. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Sam. Uh, you're a great composer and your ability to create um, inspiring uh, 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 music. 
is really appreciated and it's truly admirable. You you took great, great care of one of my childhood games, Battlefield, and your approach is daring, bold. Keep making meaningful music and keep being the great Sam that you are. And thank you so much for your time. Enjoy really, it a lot. Really yeah. Thanks, yeah.